Um, if I can ask you guys a very quick question, so Mark asked me to to take over from from him, so I have the question of the of the the list of the conversation points. Um, if we are running out of time, which usually often happens in these live sessions, is there one question in particular that you think I'm good to skip over some of the others? If it feels like conversation is really lively around something else. I think we, we are going to try to be very precise on time. Okay. Uh, there's there's one of the questions that came from the RSF VP list. Yeah. So that one, I think it's, it's about regulations and the, the, the role of regulators. Maybe we can bring that question because it is a question that came from the, from yeah. the audience. It's good to, okay. to address that one. Nice. Yeah. I'll make sure to get to that. It looks like we have people um slowly joining i think we're coming back from a break so <laughs> true true is this your first api days i i well came yesterday so yes <laughs> not the first day but the first event but it's been quite insightful right. okay nice have you had a chance to follow any of the sessions i watched a few yeah but, you know being at home makes you share your agendas <laughs> <laughs> When you used to go to physical events, you would be dedicated to the event. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely true. But yeah, interesting sessions, by the way. Yeah, fortunately, we have we we can watch them uh, for the right. Yeah, we can mm. you know, record, so we can yeah, have it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but uh, I... you had a team member who made um, she made a spreadsheet because everybody loves a great giant spreadsheet, and there we have all of the sessions and the ones that we wanted to attend. And there are some notes, so I think it's a really great way of sharing some of the key learnings. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah, so if, if that colleague is watching this session, which she might be, then hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think we'll give yeah. pardon. Yeah. I think we're nearly good to go, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. We see a few more people. Um, yeah, like you said, these are recorded. So if somebody misses the beginning, we can just, they can watch it back. So let's let's kick off. So those of us, or those who are watching, welcome for a second day of, of roundtables. This session is going to be about open banking and open insurance and the role of APIs and microservices. So open APIs, microservices, these have become some buzzwords, especially in the financial service industry recently. So you hear things like open data, open API, uh, open banking, open insurance. But what do these buzzwords actually mean and how are they used? Now, these are some of the questions that our speakers will be answering today. Uh, and we'll explore how some of these terms and the technologies behind these terms are rapidly changing the, the ways that businesses work. Um, I'll be hosting the, the session. My name is Jannika. My pronouns are she and her, and I work as a systems and open sustainability lead at Platformable. And now if we can have all of our speakers just quickly introduce yourselves and then we can dig uh, straight into the conversation. Sure. Thanks, Jannika, for hosting the session. My name is Gibson Asimento. I am the head of solutions at Sensidia looking after the EMEA region. Thanks for being able to join us today. <laughs> Good to have you here. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can go. Uh, my name is Felipe Garbin. I'm a solutions architect here at Sensidia as well. Um, I've been helping, you know, customers in Brazil and in India. So, yeah, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Hi, this, this is David Roldan, also solutions architect at Sensidia. Yeah, great. Very happy to have all of you three here. Um, let's get straight into it. So um, I thought we'd start with a little bit of definition. So like we said, API microservices, and people say they're the solution for almost every problem. But what can you explain? What are these things really? What do we mean by those terms? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So indeed, uh, there's a lot of talk that APIs and microservices are solving everything. Quite honestly, we don't believe that that's the the silver bullet for everything but it does solve many issues uh, especially when it comes to all of this open initiatives right so open banking open finance open data just like you were you were describing the in the introduction uh, all of these initiatives they are powered by apis which are in fact open apis right uh, apis are a way to define how you will expose 
your services and contracts to your partners, to your API developers that consume your API. So ultimately, to your API consumers, if you can uh, call like this. Uh, and microservices, on the other hand, they are, uh, I, I used to say, an architecture style. So it's a way to decouple applications. Back in the days, we would have huge monolith applications that would take sometimes even days to be updated. So if you need to deploy versions, whatever you're doing, it's always a big bang approach. And microservices is a way to decouple functionalities of uh, these big monolith applications to become more uh, maintainable, more scalable as well. So it's a, it's a style to build applications in a way that they are much more smaller and simpler to maintain. Uh, how they are impacting all of these initiatives. So if you think that you will have multiple microservices, multiple small pieces of, of software that are self-contained and of course responsible for certain features. Uh, and then if you think about the APIs that are exposing functionalities, basically use APIs to, uh, let's say, to wrap up or to abstract the functionalities that you have in your backend. And then perhaps you compose a series of microservices that are, again, your backend application. And then you expose only one single contract to your API consumers. So in summary, it's the ability that you have to gather functionalities and expose them to your uh, external world. And one, one interesting thing here, we constantly see APIs being, being you know, uh, treated as something that's like open banking it's mainly for external integrations right so it's bank to bank bank to fintechs but apis can also be something exposed internally as well you know so you can use exactly the same approach to expose functionalities to different business units inside the same company so it's a it's an approach that helps of course the open initiatives but also internal initiatives as well yeah, great, thank you. I think that's a really good basis for all of us to build the conversation on. Um, the point around exposing um, and data sharing, would you say that that is challenging the security? What is your view on that? Yeah, I can pick this one. Uh, yeah, for sure, Danica, uh, of course it is. I mean, opening and sharing data this is always tricky, right? When it comes to open environments. So, uh, but fortunately, integration platforms, they offer um, mechanisms to deal with potential threats. So I, I don't want to dive uh, into very technical details, but I want to just give you uh, some examples. So let's talk about authentication, right? That's the first defense. That's the first thing that you have to think when it comes to open APIs. So uh, what is this? What is authentication? Uh, it is when uh, an entity verifies uh, the identity of a user or a human or an application. So in other words, it proves that the user or the application itself um, trying to access a remote server or the API itself are really who they say they are. So to do that, uh, an API ID or an API key, they are a must. So you have to use an API key. And what is an API key? It is a unique string, uh, a unique ID string uh, generated for the application for each user of the API. And it is used to control the utilization of the API and track how it is uh, being used. So this is very important. But not all authenticated users will necessarily be authorized to access all provided APIs, right? So that's where authorization comes in. So for example, uh, some users uh, require access to retrieve information or use a get operation. But should not be able to change any information or use a put uh, operation. So using uh, an access control frame framework such as OAuth, for example, you can control the list of APIs that each specific API key or each user application can access. So see, API keys is the minimum, minimum uh, requirement for authentication. You must use other mechanisms to better protect your APIs. Um, so this is the first defense, right? Authentication and authorization. And to prevent a massive amount of API requests, for example, that can cause a DDoS attack or other misuse of the API service, 
uh, it is a must to apply a limit to the number of requests in a given time interval for each API. So this is very crucial. So when the rate is exceeded, the access is blocked from the API key, right? At least temporarily and returns the 400 to, uh, I think it's 400 to 29, I think it's to be a goal, which is the too many requests, right? So that's how we can protect from DDoS attacks. Uh, you can also protect your APIs in transit using TLS, in TLS. Uh, and this is very, uh, this is being used uh, very frequently, right, in open banking and open insurance. So in TLS, um, you have to use it because it ensures that the parties at each end of a network, network connection are who they claim to be by verifying that both have the correct, correct private keys. So we change the private keys between the, 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 the parties, right? So you can uh, have a more security uh, uh, way of, of using the APIs or exposing the APIs. Uh, so uh, there are many security mechanisms available. Uh, I just mentioned um, a few here, but it is crucial that each scenario is analyzed and one or more mechanisms uh, define it. As well. and, and if I may just uh, add on what Philippe is saying there, uh, we, we presented a workshop yesterday specifically about security. And one of the, you know, the, the, the constant uh, fears of who is exposing API is the, uh, the, the delay that applying many policies will bring to your general API call. But in fact, depending on how you implement it, on how efficient you implement that, all of these additional security mechanisms like TLS or MTLS, encryption, uh, you may add, of course, OAuth authentication authorization. Sometimes it doesn't add more than three milliseconds of processing time to one API call. So security, it's, uh, so, you know, closing data, it's a challenge when it comes to security, but for sure, uh, it pays off implementing this because you guarantee that your secure your data is properly exposed and you're not adding massive amounts of processing time to your to your uh, APIs. Yeah, so it's like there's actually quite a lot of control within the openness, I guess. So you can yeah. so that's good to hear. Thank you for the examples. Um, and then if we think about some of the advantages of adopting a platform to build open initiatives, what would you speak to that? Yeah, it's me. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, uh, an integration uh, platform uh, allow, uh, offers you a lot of uh, advantages because essentially is is uh, is a way to to make easier interconnections about uh, lost or lo lot of uh, technologies. So uh, additionally to, to that, they, they offer other, other advantages. For example, you, you can have a pre-built uh, open banking or open insurance or open whatever configurations, these uh, speed apps, compilance, for example, or they, they, are, they are used to, they are usually based on, a, on, on components so this, this allows you to adapt to the size of the bank or the students or to the size of the organization. You can, you can also uh, uh, have improvements in, in regulatory uh, domains or, or enable you to, for example, the, the learning curve is shorter. So it's easier to, to launch to the market uh, quite faster new applications and, and services, for example. That's why I think it's very recommendable to, to build your, your digital transformation strategy, no matter what the, the nature will be, upon a, a, an integration platform, yeah. yeah and, and if I may add uh, again here, uh, the, the platforms they offer, you know, David mentioned a few of the, the advantages there, but the centralized governance that you get on top of your of your APIs, so you know what is going on with your APIs. Uh, some advantages also like auditing, so you, you know exactly what is going on, who updated your APIs, who changed something. Uh, that that that's a that's a huge benefit because you get everything into one central location that then helps you to manage all your APIs, no matter how many APIs you have. But you have. A, 
a centralized view and way to control your APIs. You're on mute, David. Yeah, David, you might be muted. <laughs> Sorry, I thought that uh, I think that the, the the key issue to be successful is is not to to have APIs or not have APIs, but how about how how are you going to to use that, which is API management? How are you how are you using the APIs or uh, because because how how do you, how do you measure the success of an API or not? That is is important. For you. It's key to to know that. So API management, API government give you all tools in, in that way. Yeah, yeah, there's all really, really good points. Um, now let's talk a little bit about microservices um, and how are they used in, in open open environments? Yeah, so uh, Gibson stated previously a little bit about microservices, right? But what are microservices? Basically, uh, a microservice is focused into a small set of features. So you will start decoupling your application into small pieces. So you can break large software projects, for example, as we call it, monolith applications, right? Into loosely coupled modules. So when you're considering migrating your legacy banking or insurance software to you know, an open banking or open insurance architecture, uh, it is recommended to decouple your backend through an intensive use of APIs and also microservices. Because see, there are a lot of benefits. Uh, are surrounding, you know, microservices. For example, improved fault isolation. You can see what's happening to that specific uh, feature. All right, I, I know that that something's going on with my system, but I want to know where is the the, the, the problem, so I, I can, you know, isolate the, the problem. Uh, microservices are, are easy to understand because you know they are smaller, and you you don't have to understand the whole application. So those are some of the best benefits of using microservices. But uh, when it comes to open environments, the most important advantage of using microservices is that each microservice is able to deploy independently. So if a new uh, release uh, is going to be released or a new feature is going to be released, I do not impact the other microservices or, or the other features or the, or the whole application. Right, so uh, I'm just focusing on that specific domain or microservice. And also, it also can be um, scaled on its own. So you can allocate more resources to those parts of the application more demanding. So if one microservice needs more resources, you can you know, uh, allocate more resources to that specific microservice, so for that container. So you can more easily scale the most needed ones at the appropriate times, so as opposed to the whole application. So it's true that there are the, the drawbacks as well, because there are complexities involved in this architecture regarding management, coordination, culture. This is very important. We are not just talking about technical parts here. We are talking about culture. You have to change the mindset. You have to you know, uh, train your dev team, your squads, to work uh, in this architecture. But if the system you know, is properly sized and configured and you, know, you set a, a very good uh, microservice architecture, of course, advantages win clearly to drawbacks. Great. Um, thank you. Yeah, that was, again, really, really useful examples. Thanks for sharing. I'm just mindful of the time, so I think we're going to move on to uh, a next topic. So next is more of a business question. So we said at the beginning that these technologies are really changing the way that businesses work. Uh, now, what would you say, how can open banking and open insurance impact some of the legacy business models that we still have? Yeah, uh, I think that the, the, it is a, a giant uh, shift because in, in traditional business model, both in banking and also in insurance, were based about the ownership of the of the data, the customer the customer data. Traditionally, it was banking and an insurer who, who owns the, the data, and, and on top of that, they they they, they built their their business. With with the, with the opening with the openness, uh, the, the 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 customer data are are owned by the customers. Okay. 
So, so this this uh, this this need to to share or um, the, the information makes makes uh, organizations to to rethink the the business model and and probably to join to an ecosystem where it's it's a, a, it's a step of the on the value chain is is uh, generating value in traditional systems. Uh, the value was was considered to be generated by the the, the producer, the banking the banker or the insurer, uh, which were producing a service or, or a product that the, the customer uh, acquired. In, 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 in this, new, this new area, it's a step of, in each step of the interaction, uh, is, is, is produce value. So, so there are a lot of stakeholders in the interactions that have to take a proof, a profit from this value. So this this uh, forces institutions to collaborate with partners or or wherever to 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 deliver to the customer an enhanced experience. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And it, like you both mentioned, uh, all of you mentioned this. It seems like it's a technological shift, but it's also a huge mindset mindset yeah. shift. That yeah. And if I can sure. quickly add on that, the if, even though. It is a technical subject, right? Breaking down applications, decoupling functionalities. There are huge benefits for the business as well because uh, the way that you that you break down your corporation to business units, to domains, helps business better understand their own businesses. And then that is directly reflecting the way that the software is developed. So the way that the microservices will be then created, you know? And then you also better understand how the domains communicate to each other. And that's where you start having internal communications through APIs because you have one business domain talking to another one and they do connect through APIs. So it's it's a huge advantage from both a technical and a business standpoint as well. And, and also it offers you a new revenue stream because opening the data doesn't mean to open for free. You can you can open the data by by exchanging a, a fee to uh to a fintech for example if I'm a bank and you want to access to my customer account I you have the the, the chance to to do it but by paying something so there is another flow there in cash yeah 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 very good point then you start thinking more about the product side of the of the API yeah really really good point. Um, so we're starting to come to the end of the session. We have one question from the audience that I'd want to put forward for all of you. And then we're gonna, I think we're going to wrap up. So this is something that comes up very, very often uh, across the space, um, regulation standards. So very briefly, we've got about five minutes. So what would you say is the impact of regulations or standardization on this adopt adoption of, of open initiatives? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting, good question, uh, Yannicka. So if you think the role of the regulators, you, you see, uh, for instance, in the UK, for example, right, have very strong regulation that drives not only uh, the, the standards when it comes to uh, the security standards or how the APIs have to be exposed from a security standpoint, but they also drive the, the general interfaces. So they, how you expose data, the format of the data. And then on the other hand, you have countries like in the US, for example, open banking, it's not something that it's still, it's still starting, but the market is regulating the, the whole initiative. So meaning that you don't have a standard, right? So the market will come to a conclusion that this is our standard. Um, I was in a, in a panel discussion a couple of weeks ago where I think that one of the, the biggest concerns is the interpretation of the regulation, because sometimes you know what you have to do, but it isn't clear enough in a point that you clearly read the regulation and you say, yes, that's how I'm going to implement it. So there is a very important size uh, side of the regulators to define the regulations, to make the ecosystem more uh, or less generic and more concise. So you, you know exactly what you're doing. But there's also the downside, which is sometimes regulations are a bit tricky to understand and gives you openness to interpret the way that you want. So it's open, open, open the open, right? So I think it's a very important role 
but in general, I, I believe that regulators need to be careful about how they present the regulations to the to the parties involved. But it's a very important role when it comes to defining how the connections have to be made, defining standards, and like I said, defining the contract. So that's how you expose customer data. But I think that regulators also need to somehow think about not only the uh, the general contract, but also about how to motivate or how to bring more participants to the ecosystem. I think that's one of the, the lacks as I've been seeing at the moment. So how you bring more participants to the ecosystem. So how you, you make sure that fintechs are really consuming data from the banks and how banks are really, let's leave the word here, it's how you make sure that banks are exposing data in a way that they don't think just about their own customers, but that they think broadly about the, the, the whole ecosystem. I think that that's the challenge that we're facing at the moment. Yeah, yeah, really, really good points. Um, it's a tough question to put in two or three minutes. Uh, yeah. Anything that you, Philippe or David, you want to add before we wrap up? We're coming to the end of the session. Yeah, I think that uh, as Gibson uh, said, uh, uh, regulator needs uh, relevant use cases from the market to be able to adapt the the standard. For example, today. Uh, the Open Bank in the, uh, Europe ha has released a, a request for for comments about the uh, some some issues about P PSD two. That kind of of, of initiatives, I think, are, are right always to be open from the market to the regulation, the regulation to the market. I think that that kind of things will 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 help to to speed up adoption. Yeah. Yes, great. So in a way, you're thinking regulations is a way of really supporting the growth rather than thinking that it's just restrictions. So yeah, yeah. yeah again, another mind shift change. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up now, but um, thank you very much to all three speakers. I've learned a lot. I feel like it's been a really, really interesting session and great conversation. Um, yeah, thank you for joining. I hope that the audience, the people who joined, feel the same way. And um, I think there's a few more sessions still happening this at the end of this second day of, of API Day. So if you get a chance to to go, go and check them out. And um, yeah, thanks again for joining. Perfect. Yannicka, thank you very much for, for moderating the session. Thanks for all who managed to, to join us today. Hope it was, it was useful. Thanks all. I hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference.